Good evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup founders and their investors on what it takes to build a viable, fundable startup. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SPhase, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the largest and fastest growing organization for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. This week I'll be interviewing Phil Wickham, a former venture capitalist and now CEO of the Center for Venture Education on what it takes to be a VC, particularly in the current climate. So Phil, good to see you. Thank you for coming along. Uh, welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur. Thanks for um, having me. It's nice to be here. Not at all. <laughs> um, today we're going to be exploring the evolution of venture ca ca capital and what it takes to become a partner in a VC firm. This is something that comes up quite frequently at the events that we run. And um, while I have answers, I'd really like to take the benefit of your experience to explain that to people who are watching. So first, how did you become a VC? Well, my, my path uh, began with my days as an entrepreneur. I started a company and I was acquired by a larger company and, and that was my first exposure to this animal called a venture capitalist. And this was sort of an unusual story. It was 1990 was the time frame and I was operating in Tokyo, Japan, and I would cross paths with our venture capitalists out of New York who would fly in to see our, our progress. And didn't really know what it was and I started to investigate it, moved on to graduate school in the early 90s and continued to try to understand what this concept was, which at the time all I could really figure out was was they seem to be mutual fund managers who buy and sell stocks, but they do in small private companies versus public companies. Mm -hmm. and, and I had been an entrepreneur and, and, and was aspiring to be an entrepreneur and was continuing dialogues with venture capitalists and then came across something called the Kaufman Fellows Program coming out of graduate school, which was a two-year postgraduate fellowship that was designed actually to put new blood into the industry and I applied to that program and fortunately was selected and that started me on my journey. Okay, so, so where did you operate as a VC once you'd been through the Kaufman Fellows Program? Well, the, the two-year program is a practicum, so I spent two years on the ground with a venture fund in Boston um, and in 1996 time frame moved west to Silicon Valley and have been here ever since. The bulk of my experience, though, has been leveraging some of my international experience. So the first five years I was out here, I worked for uh, a fund that did quite a bit of work in, in Japan in terms of taking our U.S. companies into Asian markets. So, mm -hmm. But I've been here for 12 years now. Okay. So, so that was your first experience <coughs> of the Kaufman Fellows Program, which is now run under the Center for Venture Education, CBE, the organization that you now head, head, head up. So that was your early exposure to it, but I understand you, you ended up be, becoming a board member. How did that happen? Well, I was, in, I was actually in the first class of the Kaufman Fellows Program and had always maintained a very active involvement from about 1994, 95 on. My, when we, we, made, we, we had an opportunity in early in this decade to actually take the program out from under the umbrella of the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation in Kansas City, which is a $2 billion entity, one of the larger foundations in the country and the largest in the world dedicated to entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and focus and, and actually create an independent entity. And so, like a lot of things, I was, I was actively involved, but I was also there when that message started to come out, and it was just an opportunity for me to choose that I wanted to be involved. So I was one of the three people who just got in early and we, we, we worked on creating the, the legal structure of the new foundation of the Center for Venture mm -hmm. Education. And like a lot of things that are great startups, you know, if you, if you blink, the next thing you know, you're in up to your <laughs> neck. And so that's, 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 okay. that's how it happened. So can, can you expand on what this new model of the Center for Venture Education actually does? Well, it's it's not it's not a new model uh, so much. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do are new. We we haven't we haven't uh, varied from our roots at all, which are still founded in the values of Ewing, Mary, and Kaufman. And, and we're about building a community of venture capitalists that have a philosophy and a set of values. And the philosophy and set of values are around 
entrepreneur first, entrepreneur centric approach, a, a, a community that's dedicated to lifelong leadership development and dedicated to a, a, a set of values that we think is the right way to operate. The big change that occurred when we spun out was we went from uh, fairly strict guidelines of what at the time was a foundation that was very domestically focused. And so our program was focused on bringing U.S. citizens together with top U.S. venture funds to create mm -hmm. a mentor structure uh, and, and a, an educational dynamic that tapped into all the benefits of the wisdom that was resident in these great funds. When we spun out, we just became more flexible. And so we began to, you know, first and foremost, move outside the walls of the United States and, and begin to reach internationally because in the time frame that we were legally created in 2003, the international scene in, in innovation and young companies was just really starting to catch fire. Mm -hmm. And so we started that process. We were able to bring in non-U.S. citizens. We were able to look at new models looking at the evolution of uh, corporate venture and, and tapping into some of the leading corporations and their venture operations. Some innovative approaches to technology transfer through universities and lab-based funds and so forth. So it just, it, it allowed us to spread our wings, so to speak. And today we, we sit now, we have 140 funds, uh, uh, 25 of which are corporations in, in 18 countries and five continents, practicing venture in just about every conceivable model you can think of from you know early stage in Vietnam to infrastructure in Ghana in West Africa to early stage in Stockholm Sweden to quite a bit of what you would expect to see of the traditional venture capital on Sand Hill Road here in the valley. Mm -hmm. And talking about Sand Hill Road here here in the valley this is what many people view as the cradle of, of, of venture capital going back to maybe the sort of late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. when it started with a, with a few people who were uh, angels, individual angels, coming out of some of the, 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 the companies that started then. Big question, what, you see, what, what do you see that's happened in venture capital over the past 20 years? So from the 80s, say, when it went through a boom time in the 90s up to now and then what do you see happening now it's yeah, it's a big question so, so, so really big question take time so i think what's happened in in my exposure to the industry is is roughly the last 15 years or so but i i let me take a crack at it i think i think what's happened i think the most important one obvious is uh, development is the globalization of the supply side and the demand side of innovation. What I mean by that is companies used to be built in the United States with American resources. They sold product to American companies and they exited, either sold to large American companies or went public on American markets. Mm -hmm. Companies can start everywhere, anywhere, and they can go anywhere for their resources, their supply side, whether it's people, technology, capital, and they can go anywhere very quickly for markets and, and sales and channels. And so that's one obvious change and that's been an evolution. I think the one that doesn't get talked about as much is the, the, the change in the dynamic between the venture capitalist and the entrepreneur, driven primarily by the rapid sophistication of the entrepreneur. The metaphor I often use is, is IBM and data processing going from the 60s to what it is in, you know, in the 90s in that there was an information monopoly that IBM had that was not unlike the information monopoly that venture capitalists had. You'd walk into an organization and say, you have data processing needs, this is what you do, and the customer would nod their head and they'd pay the bill and off they went because they didn't really have an alternative and they didn't really know how data processing worked. And I think venture capitalists used to have the same sway over entrepreneurs. As entrepreneurs had no options, they didn't understand the process. They felt themselves lucky to get venture mm. capital 20, 30 years ago. Yes, definitely. Because there was no other way to get it. And I think as they've worked through the process and see how it, how the capital formation process works and how hard it is to build these companies, the right thing has sort of come out of the mix, which is that the capital, the cash, is probably the, the lowest value commodity in the mix of creating a great company. And the gem, the rare gem, is the entrepreneur, the leader, and the team that he or she can build that can create the company. So that power shift has been very substantial, where today the great entrepreneurs know that they're 
they're in control and the venture capitalists are an important yet subordinate service provider to those entrepreneurs and that's been an adjustment that venture capitalists have had to make and you see that one of the obvious hallmarks of that is how venture capital as firms and individuals have become fascinated with the concept of branding and positioning because it's no longer enough to put a shingle up with a checkbook and expect the best things to come to you. You have to work to win a spot uh, on, on the balance sheet, so to speak, of the best companies. Interesting, very interesting. Okay, so given that as a backdrop, what's happening to venture cap the venture capital industry now? I mean, we're, we're already seeing in the paper stories of, uh, you know, Harvard um, has, was, was trying to sell Right. Uh, some of its VC uh, portfolio, um, they uh, an, uh, have lost eight million billion dollars from their investments, right. um, so, and, and they have been one of the biggest limited partners into venture funds. So, what is now the current situation in in the venture world? Well, it's it's uh, it's not the happiest time. In, in venture in the last few years. It's, it's probably not as bad from a morale standpoint as it was during the implosion of the bubble, uh, of the internet bubble in, uh, earlier in this decade. There are a lot, there are a lot of stories out there um, with regards to what's happening. Uh, you speak to Harvard as a limited partner, which mm. is the entity that funds venture capitalists that enable them to fund entrepreneurs. So in that food chain, they're at the highest point. And, and what I would say characterizes all of the discussions, and I'll talk at a very high level, and, and everything that's going on is it's completely bifurcated. It's extreme on both ends. So every time you hear a piece of bad news, it's typically pretty bad. People are depressed. There's some sort of disaster going on. Mm -hmm. But it's not uncommon to turn around then and get a piece of good news. So Harvard's selling its position, and it's lost money. On the other hand, I'm aware of the fact that it's just doubled down on another fund in October that it just closed on when it was well understood that things weren't that great. There are foundations and endowments that have been hit very badly and are seem to be leaving the industry in droves. That remains to be seen. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, we're all talking about the denominator effect and how that's really, really hurt the overall position of these foundations. We have no idea what that means. If the markets do recover, then th that could change the behavior, but we do see a lot of discussion of long-term players leaving the market, but the flip side of that is there are a number of players in the queue that haven't been in for a long time or have never been in that are looking to come in. So you're seeing, for people leaving, you're seeing people um, mm. people coming in. And pension funds, um, lesser known endowments, international entities, sovereign funds from wealthy nations. The Middle East was there's a lot of buzz in the Middle East for a while. We don't know what the change will be now with you know the the fall of the the price of oil, mm -hmm. but they're still sitting on just massive amounts of cash. And I think it's it the same dynamic seems to bubble down to the company level and the individual level. If a company is well positioned, if it's got a strong balance sheet, if it's been running lean and mean, which a lot of these one of the side benefits, sort of unintended benefits of this tough exit environment as it's kept companies running very lean. There's been very little waste. So companies that are in a good position are, are really just moving forward as if almost nothing happened. Their antenna are up a little higher. They're cautious about cash. But in some ways, it's a great situation for them because they're often competing against companies that may not have been as well managed or aren't as well capitalized. Those companies are going away. So the message for a lot of these entrepreneurs from their investors is this is the time to charge forward and, and treat it as a market share grab opportunity, which is a, 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 a traditional op opportunity that you see in these kinds of downturns. And you see it at the human, at the human individual level. You see people that if they seem to be doing poorly, it's, it's, they're in pretty bad shape. And if they're, if they're in good shape, they tend to be pretty excited about what's, what's going on. But it is, I think it's we're in unprecedented times as far as what this meltdown means. I don't think we really understand the scope of the impact of particularly the derivative market and how long that went and how big that got, it's, it's going to be an interesting uh, few months to see how, how the statistics of that sort out and, and how the new administration, the Obama administration, 
responds and, and, and influences direction when they come in on January 20th. Of course, yes, that's, that's going to be, be something that, uh, that could change things. So right now, from a variety of sources, um, we have the message that while money is still available for A round fundings, companies that are already funded need to conserve their cash. Um, it's going to be a year, maybe two years, before they'll be able to get a next round. And even if they can get the next round, they'll be at a much lower valuation than they would have expected previously. So with that as a backdrop, and also again with your insights that uh, venture capitalists have gone from being somewhat secretive, perhaps viewed as the kingmakers in the early days, to <coughs> now being much more open service providers to the entrepreneur. Entrepreneur and the entrepreneur is in a much better standing. How do you see the industry evolving in both the near term and, and the longer term? So, so it's interesting. The, the the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur, is in a stronger position if that entrepreneur is accomplished. And so, I think we've seen uh, a feast or famine dynamic develop for entrepreneurs in the mm -hmm. very little middle class. So, if you're in a position of strength, then your your situation is 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 good. I think you'll see very little impact on how competitive it's going to get for dollars out there. The very best entrepreneurs will command and they'll they'll be able to to gain investments from the best best people and they'll okay. be able to command a price that will will generally be positive. Though obviously there'll be some effect. How how does it affect things going forward? I, mean, I think this is. I think we're at a crossroads. We've been at a crossroads for a while, trying to figure out what this industry means. And I think one of the one of the the, the obvious impacts is a lot of entrepreneurs are questioning whether venture capital is is the no brainer mm. form of capital mm. that they should have. Yeah. Um, we've heard discussions of you know there's there's obviously a trend in corporations going for smaller acquisitions. Venture capitalists are not built for small exits. They're built for they're built to come in and fund aggressively and grow companies to to a large size and sell them for a large amount of money. When that happens, it's a beautiful thing. Um, when a company builds a niche product and can create some value and smell it, sell, sell at a small level, uh, what small in our minds would be a twenty, thirty, fifty million dollar exit mm. versus a two or three, four hundred million dollar exit. That's a very nice thing for an entrepreneur if they can do it on a very small amount of cash. Uh, when you when you have a situation of a lot of venture money and a small exit, that's not a pleasant thing. Right. So I think what's I think what's happened is you've seen entrepreneurs as their sophistication grows, saying, "What are the options out there for for what a venture capitalist brings to me, which is which is resources, funding resources, as well as guidance, coaching, access to." supply side and demand side resources, the sort of things that a syndicate of venture capitalists would, would bring. That's created a very interesting competitive dynamic and we, we see some of this uh, here in the valley but you get outside the valley you see, see even more of it which is family offices, high net worth individuals who have large pools of money hiring venture capitalists away to come in and do um, venture work or perhaps a vertical niche of media and doing mm. everything from early stage to growth stage to public companies in digital media or or software or or life sciences whatever it may be mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing corporations getting increasingly clever increasingly committed to the space and doing some interesting things um, angel networks of high net worth individuals who don't have a tremendous amount of money but together in teams of five or ten may be able to put enough together, a couple million dollars to get a web 2.0 company off the ground into a reasonable exit. And so I think that there's this emerging, the, it, nature does abhor a vacuum and, and when the venture capitalists move out or move up into higher segments, somebody will come in with capital because the entrepreneurs just keep coming, which is great. They're coming, fa I think, faster and more furious than ever. So you just see, I think we'll see, we'll see an increasing fragmentation in the venture market, people moving away from traditional labels, getting into more niche spaces around the three dimensions of venture, which are stage, sector, and geography. Interesting. Very interesting. And, and certainly, just, just about your, your, your comment on, on, on entrepreneurship, if our membership and event attendance is anything to go by, 
entrepreneurship is not only just alive and well in Silicon Valley, it's growing. Yes. So yes, that's, that's cer certainly there. But g given that um, situation that you have there, I mean, it's, it's difficult enough for the average, not the rock star on entrepreneur to, to get money. The rock stars can always get the money. It's difficult enough for the, for the average entrepreneur to figure out who to go to approach, how to find that people, how to get an introduction to them. What is this evolution of, of the venture industry going to mean for the average entrepreneur looking to seek money? Um, does it become more complex? Does it become easier? What, what, what happens? Well, it's, it's, it, it, I'm not sure if it becomes easier or harder, and I'm not sure if it's more or less complex, but I think what it, what it probably means is that the venture capitalists that are left standing will be focused on proven entrepreneurs who are looking to build very large companies. And so a first-time entrepreneur or somebody who may not have the highest aspirations probably has less of a chance to secure institutional venture dollars from one of the funds up and down Sand Hill Road or, or in downtown Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And for them, it becomes, I think, more of a, a, a creative process. I think the start, the spark of life for a young company is, is going to be tough. And it's, it's the greatest selling point. And, and I think one of the funny things is I was mentored by an amazing guy in Boston who started life in the 60s and would tell me stories of venture in the 60s and I hear younger people now talking about the new era of venture and the stories I hear sound an awful lot now sound an <laughs> awful lot like the 60s so I think right. we've come full circle to a point where you know having having a second mortgage on your house and really having skin in the game and having convinced your friends and family to put their money in because your entire ecosystem is at stake if you blow this is really kind of the 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 price of admission to begin to get real dollars to flow in this environment, people want to know that you're, you know, you're, 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 you're committed. You're, you know, the pig and not okay. the chicken. So. Okay. What what does this mean for people who have aspirations to enter the VC in in in, in industry? How is that changing? I mean, there's there's been some routes of people going to be to be associates coming from the the big well-known business schools, others. Um, going through the Kaufman Fellows program, is it still an industry that you would encourage people to go into? Uh, and what does it mean for people wanting to get into this industry? So there's a few questions there. I think I think it's 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 a it's an industry like any other unique industry. It's 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 a it's a fabulous industry if you're right for it. And so we're cautious to use concepts like encouraging people because it's tough and it's unique and so we encourage people to explore it and we encourage people to go into it with a great deal of caution but if they're really bought into it then it will it happens somewhat naturally it's a person there are some classic hallmarks of of a venture capitalist versus an entrepreneur it's, uh, it's got anything from uh, attention span a, a laser focused person is likely to be more successful in a startup than they are in a venture capital firm. Somebody mm -hmm. who can spin 500 plates at once and, and is, is, is more likely to be successful in a venture firm where there's very little structure. Somebody who needs a lot of feedback and constant feedback, daily feedback, weekly feedback, monthly feedback, better in a startup because you get that feedback. You build things, you add features, you, you sell a product. Venture has very little feedback. It's the feedback cycles are years, and it's a very tough thing to operate with no one telling you whether you're doing a very good job or not, and believe that three, four, five years down the road, you're going to start to see returns on your investments. It's compounded by the fact that most people see their bad returns first. So the first bit of news you get mm. is unpleasant. So it takes it takes some spine, and it takes some temperament to do the business. So so first off, you you, you really have to make sure you're right for the business. Nothing has changed, I think, in fact, it's more so that entering the business is based on really, really deep relationships. Very few people enter this business at any serious level without a deep relationship with at least a partner in a firm. These are not organizations that have hiring processes. They, they aren't. These are some mix between families and, and private clubs, and the, it's not a hiring process as much as it's 
some, I, I call it an invitation process. I have a colleague who calls it an adoption process. <laughs> and I think both, both are, are more accurate than a hiring process. It's a privilege that can be taken away with very little warning. Right. And, and so the relationship is very important. So you'll see in the more senior ranks, most common is an entrepreneur who has been successful with that firm and is a known entity and seems to have reached a stage in their life where they want to move away from doing to, to more coaching. And, and, and coaching across a, a range of entrepreneurs, that's very common. And at the younger ranks, it can be somebody who may have reported in an operating position at a Cisco to someone who's become a partner in the firm, and they may bring that person in as an associate or a principal to develop them. We do see some, still some hires of associates straight out of business school. That, that does happen. I think, so, so there's, to, to the other point of your question is, I think going back to this idea that venture has become very, fragmented and there's a lot of different flavors of it out there if your goal is to get into institutional venture a partnership on silicon valley that that's likely to get tougher and tougher i think if you're willing to look at a broader definition of what venture is you're still in a position to work with entrepreneurs to provide them capital and resources to be somebody who can use your pattern recognition to help them identify a, a, a navigable path to success to coach them through that process. There's a much, much broader array of opportunities out there, and you just have to, I think it's an entrepreneurial business in and of itself. So we see things every day of people coming in with new positions where a lot of times they've invented them in the negotiation process with an organization. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Okay, unfortunately we've run out of time. I, I have many more questions I'd like to ask you, but we have run out of time. Phil, thank you very much for coming along. I do appreciate it. And uh, so it's goodbye from uh, the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, and see you again next month. Thank you. Uh, that was terrific. <laughs> wow.